Greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English B. And our objective now for the hour is to work with W.H. Auden's Monsieur de Beaux Arts. You're on page 1176, 1177. And as we look at now this poem, there's a bit of information that you have to know to be able to understand at all this poem. So for example, you could read this poem a thousand times. It will make almost no sense to you if you don't know how to look at the picture on 1176. So that's where you want to go first. Two things you want to write down about this picture. One, you want to write down the author of this painting was uh, Peter Berg. B-R-U-G-H-E-L. Okay? Burgum. The title of the painting is The Fall of Icarus. The Fall of Icarus. Now, wait, wait a minute. We got, we, we got to review maybe a bit of Greek mythology. Mm, I think I know something. I can remember something about this name, Icarus. Maybe you'll remember the story. Icarus is a young man. His father's name is Daedalus. Daedalus and Icarus get thrown inside of a prison, and Daedalus is a brilliant inventor. He says, I know how we get out of this place. I'm going to build wings. When you put them on, they will allow for you to fly. Icarus rolls his eyes the way most sons do when they hear their father speaking. Yeah, right. And sure enough, Daddy, Daedalus, oh, puts the wings on his boy, and sure enough, they work. And Icarus starts flying, and Dad again screams, Daedalus again screams at his boy, remember, don't fly too close to the sun because the heat will melt the wax off the wings and you will fall into the sea and you will die and I love you I don't want to lose my boy but Icarus oh does this sound like one or two of us in our high school years Icarus was too excited to jump out the window and start flying he didn't have time to listen to the old man so he jumps out Whoa, it works. He's flying. Wouldn't this be fun? He's just flying. Oh, what a great, exhilarating feeling that is. Of course, he wants to see how much higher he can go. Daedalus is screaming at his boy, don't, don't fly so high. <sighs> the story ends tragically with Icarus falling into the sea and dying. Now, that's the story. It's a famous story, and of course it's been used in many different kinds of ways. In our classroom, for example, we even call, when you come in to get extra help, Daedalus Club. That is to say, sometimes the Icarus student has to hear from Mr. McGee, the Daedalus, right? Time to go to work. We have a little work to do. We could jot down right now at 3B at least one time in our life. When an adult dadless in our life said, hey, you know what, I think you better hear me. You better do X, Y, Z. And we were too busy to not actually hear. That is to say, listen, we heard, we just didn't listen. Right? And then into the sea we fell. And of course, while we were falling, we went, oh, yeah. They warned me about, oh, yeah. Right? Right? We're all familiar with that. But now I'm going to turn to this poem. Two things. One, W.H. Auden goes to a museum where he looks at this painting. This painting is called The Fall of Icarus. And there's one thing about this painting that fascinates Auden. Let's see if you can guess what it is. Go ahead, I dare you. Look at the picture right there on 1176 and see the one thing that for you is Interesting and revealing. I'll ask it this way. Can you point to Icarus in this painting? Can you point to Icarus in this painting? Now, of course, you can't point to Icarus in this painting if you don't know the story of the fall of Icarus. Would you agree with me? You can't really point to the painting if you don't know that Icarus is going to be the one who ends up, no, he's not the guy behind the plow, right? 
Icarus is in the water. What do we see of Icarus? Only his legs. Right? But wait a minute. Notice something interesting about this painting. Where is Icarus in relationship to everything else in the painting? In fact, some of you will say, dude, this is kind of like a Where's Waldo game. I had to look at this painting for a number of minutes before I could even find... Oh! There he is. Hidden. In a lower corner. The fall of Icarus? You would think the fall of Icarus would put him right in the middle of the painting with big white legs so everyone could see him falling. Peter Burgle's painting makes Auden think. Home he goes. See, this is what brilliance does. Home he goes. Down he sits. And he writes a poem. But he references the poem by where he saw the picture. In a French museum, the Musée du Beau, Beau here, of course, here means beautiful arts. That is to say, the beautiful, the beautiful museum <coughs> in Belgium and Brussels, where he had seen this picture. And for him, it was a powerful propedutic. Now, I'm going to use that word. You want to write that word down as best you can. It's didactic. What does that mean? It teaches something. This painting for Auden teaches him something. Now, I'm going to say this out loud to start this discussion. This is one of the darkest poems you will ever read. It's one of the most disturbing poems high school seniors study with me. It sits right in that same family with Prophyra's lover. That poem that you read and go, whoa, 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 what did we just read? That, that kind of poem. Got me? But let's point out, Auden is writing after Browning. Did Auden know about Prophyra's lover and the great work of Browning? Of course, of course. Auden is writing in the 20th century, and so he's not going to be so self-evident. This poem's going to take a little bit of work. I can say it out loud. This is one of the more difficult poems to read if you don't know the background. Let's go ahead now and work through the poem. I'm on 1177. Monsieur de Buarts. W.H. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position. How it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking duly alone. How, when the aged are reverentially, passionately waiting for their miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful <coughs> martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner. Some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Burgle's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had on the white legs disappearing into the green water, and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sail <coughs> calmly on. Now, I love to teach this poem because it is a way to show you how poetry has and can have a powerful effect on the way you see the world if you are capable of opening your mind to see it. Let's play a game or two right away. Let's start at 2B. It maybe won't surprise you that's where we begin. And notice that this poem is actually two poems. Did you see this? There's two stanzas to this thing that we want to jot down at 2B. Do you see it right away? There's going to be a first stanza, and we're going to ask, what does he say? And there's going to be a second stanza, and we're going to ask, what does he say? That is to say, level one. And then we're going to get to the final lines of this poem and go, whoa, what is, what is Auden saying about the human condition? That you are going to want to write down at 2A. What is Auden saying about the human condition? But let's just exegete the poem at level one, shall we? Notice how the poem begins. About suffering. They were never wrong. The old masters. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, now, wait a minute. What is suffering? We want to write that word down at level one. And we want to define it. Give your best definition of suffering. 
What does it mean to suffer? You'll maybe remember that Gudama Buddha sits underneath his Bodhi tree where he will then meditate for a long period of time until he finally reaches enlightenment. And what is the first truth that he teaches? Life is, the Sanskrit word is, dukkha. That is to say, suffering. The very first teaching of the Buddha is, life sucks. Life is <coughs> painful. Life is frustrating. Life is suffering. Notice, Auden doesn't mention Buddha or Christ or any other famous teacher. He just calls them all what? Old, capital O, Masters, capital M. In other words, the old farts had it right about suffering. That all of life is about pain. All of life is about suffering. But notice the use of the colon in this poem. Do you see it? After the, war, after the terminal masters, notice there's a colon there. How well they, they who, they who, how well they understood, they who, the masters, right, the old masters, the teachers, how well they understood it's, it's what? What's it's here, human position? It's what? See, I'm teaching you how to read, learning how to read closely. How well the old masters understood it's human position, meaning what? Suffering, suffering human position. In other words, dude, if you decide to get off and to take one of these thingies with little thingies at the end and toes and fingers, and you're going to put a, some mashed up food inside of this thing and walk around, there is absolutely one thing that the old masters all said, I can guarantee is going to be a part of that experience. And that is, it's going to suck. It's going to suck. You're going to have all kinds of pain. You're going to have frustration. You're going to have pain. <sighs> You're going to do that. Auden says, you know what? The old farts, the teachers, they were all right about this thing called suffering. It's human position. Notice how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking duly along. Whoa, 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 what's he just said? <coughs> Can you put it in your own words? What's he say about suffering? So you walked up this morning and you asked your pal, how's it going? And your pal went, oh man, it sucks. I had like the worst weekend. Here you go. Oh, sorry to hear that. I gotta get to class. Sucks to be you. <laughs> or did you go, oh, tell me. Go into the details. I really would like to hear. Ah. About suffering, the old farts were wrong. It's right in the middle of the human existence. But something interesting Auden's gonna point out about his understanding of the way we think about suffering. Suffering, if it's your problem, is your problem. In other words, what are we saying? Suffering only matters if it was. Right? Suffering only matters if it's my pain. Notice how when you get sick, you want everybody to take care of you. Ask how you're doing. Bring you something to eat. Pamper you. But when it's somebody else, it's, hey, I hope you're feeling all right. Hey, I gotta go. I'll see you this afternoon. How about you? Fine. Go. Oh, wait a minute. Auden is making a comment about the human condition. He gives us a couple of examples to drive his point home. Some of the most brutal word pictures about to happen. Take a look at this one. He says, how suffering takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking duly along. How, when the aged, the old people, are reverentially, passionately waiting for the miraculous birds, oh yay, there's a child about to be born, so awesome. There always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, right? Notice, top of the next page, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. In other words, one person's joy can often be another person's sorrow or pain. How fascinating. The old people are like, yay, there's going to be a new birth. The children are like, Psh, big, big deal. Who, why do we got to add more to the, seriously? We're going out to play. What is a hallmark of being a child? I am only interested in me. Hmm. He's not done. 
Now to a really disturbing word picture. The old masters, top of 1178, they never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow. In a corner, some untidy spot, where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. Makes no sense to you until I tell you the way often that individuals were killed, martyred, was they would tie their hands to one pony, tie their feet to either a tree or another pony. So you're stretched out and then hit the rump end of the pony. Making the pony jolt and run as hard away from the tree. Or both ponies being hit at the same time. Making them run separate. Always ending in the literal tearing apart of the human body. The arms and the legs actually coming out of their sockets and tearing apart. Disturbing image. And yet Auden is not interested in anything other than the pony who will go back under his shade tree and rub his rear end up against a tree. Does the pony have any sense of what he's done? Zero. Does he know that he has killed a human being? Zero. And what do the dogs do? They come and they lick up whatever's left. Do the dogs have any clue what's going on? Zero. Whoa! Well, now, wait a minute. I told you this was a two-part poem. We're just to the first, we're through the first poem, and I can tell by the looks on some of your faces, you're like, whoa, what kind of poem are we into here? Some of you will say, this is more disturbing than Prophera's lover. This is disturbing. What has he said about the human condition and suffering? What has he said about you sitting right now in a building where all around you in rooms are people who this morning had real pain? They had real suffering. Outside of this building, in this town, people woke up this morning in unbelievable anguish. Some of you even drove past the hospital this morning on your way here. And it didn't even occur to you, there are people inside of that building in tremendous pain. Now, can we be fair? If you were in that building right now, you wouldn't be here. Would you be having a different kind of experience other than listening to the old man drone on about some stupid poem? What if, for example, something tragic had happened to you this morning on your way here, and that's where you were? Ah. What are we saying about the human condition and suffering? What are we saying? What are we saying about what we care about? What pain we care about, and what pain we don't care about. What pain do we care about? Right? If I'm in that building, the hospital, right, I've got a certain view. If I'm not in that building in the hospital, how's my view? The human condition seems to suggest, yeah, it's true. Suffering is a part of life, but the only suffering we seem to really care about <coughs> We're kind, of like, we're kind of like the horse rubbing its rear end against the tree. Ow, oh, that kind of stung. Why do they hit me on the butt to make me run? Zero idea about the pain it inflicted. None. It doesn't know. End of the first stanza. Second stanza. Some of you will say, ah, that is not the human condition at all. We care about each other. When I ask my friend, how's it going? And my friend says, terrible. I really want to know. I'm not that kind of hard, callous person that you're making me out to be. Auden drives the poem home by saying, are you familiar with the picture, The Fall of Icarus? Some of you couldn't even find him. 
Whoa. Auden is playing a nasty game with us. Oh, really? You want to argue that we care a lot about other people's pain? Then why is it it took you 30 seconds to find Icarus in the painting? In Burgle's Icarus, for instance. I'm, I'm reading. In Burgle's Icarus, for instance. Notice he just uses the first, right, the, the last word of the title. Remember, what's the title of the poem, uh, of the painting? What do we call it? What do we call it? You wrote it in your notes. The fall of Icarus, right? Notice. In Burgle's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. Go ahead, I dare you. Flip back and look at that painting again. Notice. There's lots of things happening in that painting. How many of them care about Icarus falling into the water? Zero. Go ahead, just start looking at everybody in the painting. The plowman, what's he doing? Plowing his field. The ship, sailing. And some of you go, oh, yeah, there's Icarus in the lower. Oh, crap. Is that... A working metaphor of the way we live with each other. Auden thinks so. Are you ready for this now? Auden is going to use this painting <coughs> as a way to argue for the alienation of the modern condition. I'll say it again. You want to put it in your notes. The alienation of the modern condition. What does it mean to be alienated? What does that mean? To be alienated, set apart. Yeah, to somehow feel separated from. Notice what he says. In Virgil's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. Put in your own words, what's he say? The plowman probably heard the kid falling out the sky screaming as he hit the, right? Hit the water. But for the plowman, notice what he says, it was not an important failure. In other words, the plowman is only interested in what? In plowing. I mean, he's just interested in doing what he does. Notice, the sun shone as it had on the white legs disappearing into the green water, and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to, and sailed calmly on. Oh, what does he say about the reason that the ship itself didn't even stop. Why wouldn't the ship stop and save the boy? Yeah. What kind of ship? Did you see it? Expensive. Delicate. Ship. Auden. A genius with a couple of words. What does it suggest to you that he uses the word expensive? The ship is probably doing what? Right? He's taking stuff to the mall. Wait a minute, this sounds very much like a romantic poet we once studied, or we soon will study. Wordsworth will tell us the world is too much with us late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. This is a very romantic idea as well. We are so consumed with our own... <coughs> well, you finish it for your notes now. This is the end of our poem. Humans, so consumed with X... They never see why. Go ahead and fill it in. Humans are so consumed with X, meaning what? X is what? Our own pain, our own sorrow, our own suffering, that we rarely are able to see why. What is why? Everybody else is pain. Everybody else is suffering. Now, for Auden, the reason for this is because the way modern world has become. Question. Now we'll get to 3B. Do you think because of all of our technologies we're more close with each other? I mean, I even see some of you, right, even during my lecture, you, you had to reference your handheld, right, needed to see. Uh, somebody might be talk, talking to me or something happening, you know, I got it. I need to know. We talk more. We are connected more. Would you agree with me? We are connected more. But are we closer? Do we actually understand others' pain? Others' suffering? Hmm. Interesting. Why is that, do you think? 
What is that? I had a student once say, you know what? That's very disturbing because I live at home with people. I've looked at them for all of my high school career and never once really thought of them as a person. i got to be honest. I don't really even know who those people are. I don't know what they, what they really care about. I know that they probably had crap, bad crap happen in their life. I just don't know a whole lot about it. If that's true of my own family members, what's it true of the people who I don't even know? Hmm. So what do you want to say in conclusion about this poem? Why, why do a lot of readers call this a very dark poem? Write it down. Why do, some, why do some readers of this poem call it a pretty dark poem? What's dark about it? Auden seems to be suggesting what about human beings? Yeah, we just do not care. It's like that famous cartoon where those two guys are walking out of his house and, he sa and they say, Dude, I'm really hungry watching that documentary about starving children in Africa. Let's go have a pizza. Whoa. See, some of us do like this, go, wow. And yet, wait a minute, we can easily point the finger back the other way. We're coming off of a weekend where all kinds of tragic things happened in the news all over the world. Oh, they did? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, really? I, I thought you looked at your handheld. Well, I don't look at stuff like that. Or I guess I read something about happening in Ukraine, but pff, sucks to be them. Whoa. Until, of course, it happens in our community, or it happens to us. And they were kind of interested. Hmm. Dark view of human existence. Auden trying to drive home a point that T.S. Eliot will have made in a poem you maybe have heard of called The Hollow Men. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Remember? Auden will take it one step further and say, we can't even care for each other anymore. This is the way the world ends. Remember Elliot? Not with a bang, but with a... <sighs> oh, well. Dark. Now, what's the point of a poem like this? Let's finish. What's the point of a poem like this that says, nobody even cares about Icarus falling out of the sky. The plowman's like, yeah, it sucks to be him. I gotta keep working. And the ship's like, yeah, I gotta get some stuff to the mall. I don't have time. What is the point of a poem like this? What is it suggesting? Maybe change in what way? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, some students have said, you know, after I read this poem, I realize I'm kind of an uncaring, unfeeling person a lot of the time, especially about other people's pain. Of course, what's most fascinating, and I, I talk to ball players about this all the time. So, for example, this guy gets his knee jacked, and he's walking around on crutches as he gets ready to have his, C, his surgery for knee. And he's not going to be, he's not going to be able to participate in the next season. And he confides to me, I remember in my years as an athlete, all those other ball players this happened to. And I just went like this, yeah, man, sorry. sorry. He said, only now do I understand what that means. I never understood it until now, when it's my pain. And then I go, oh, man, that sucks. Hmm. Well, there you go. W.H. Auden's, isn't that interesting? The title of the poem leads you to have no idea what this poem's going to be about. And if you don't know this other painting, you don't get it either. Kind of interesting, huh?